I'm going to introduce our panelists. For Ralph Waldo Emerson, the public intellectual was a preserver of the past's great ideas. For Edward Said, his other mission was to advance human freedom through political engagement. Both believed that the thinker's interaction with a larger audience was vital. What has become of the public intellectual's role in these times? As we begin with 7th Penn Road Voices Festival, I want to note that at the instigation of the festival, Simon Rushdie, as chair, suggested there be a working day on Thursday to celebrate the 25th anniversary and the revisiting of the theme, the writer's imagination and the imagination of the state. Writers respond to what's gone wrong and how to fix things. Through language, text, words, images, imagination, and reason, writers shape the world and witness what we see around us. This evening, we are kicking off the Panel of Voices Festival with a panel of distinguished writers. Manuel de Lope is one of the most respected Spanish authors. He was jailed under Franco's dictatorship and went into exile in 1996, first in Geneva, then in the south of France. He returned in Madrid in 1993. Since 1978, he has published a series of widely regarded novels, most recently, the Wrong Blood, the first to be translated into English. It came out last fall. The novel deals in part with the Spanish Civil War, and the New York Times reviewer called it a fever dream of a book. Peter Godwin, who was born and raised in Zimbabwe, then known as Rhodesia, has served as Eastern European and diplomatic correspondent for the London Sunday Times, and a award winning and chief correspondent for the BBC's Assignment. He is an award winning filmmaker and author. His six nonfiction books include When the Crocodile Eats the Sun, a memoir of Africa, and most recently, The Fear, The Last Days of Robert Mugabe and the Martyrdom of Zimbabwe. Thomas Lair, oh, sorry. I believe that was a mixed room. Linda Pullman is a Dutch freelance writer, author, columnist, and journalist. She has lived and worked in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and also traveled with UN peacekeeping missions in Somalia, Haiti, and Rwanda. Her experiences have led to her latest book, The Crisis Caravan, What's Wrong with Humanitarian Aid, as well as her book, We Did Nothing, Why the Truth Doesn't Always Come Out When the UN, UN Goes In. This comes in part from her experiences during the UN mission in Rwanda in 1995 when she became an eyewitness to the slaughter of an estimated 4,000 refugees. Eva Leterre is a French writer and linguist and a member of the international literary group ULIPO. He is a regular Twitterer for Le Monde. He's the author of uh, multiple books, but four of them in particular have just been translated into English, so American audiences will be seeing them this year, including Enough About Love from Other Press and The Sextine Chapel from Dalpy Archive. We have a, such a wonderful group of people. I want to have each of them speak first uh, uh, with an individual kind of statement, and then I'm hoping that we will, we will kick some questions around amongst each other. Um, we have about t 10 minutes for questions at the end, so you might bear that in mind. I'm going to start at my far left with Eve and ask him to give um, a response to the question, what is the role of the public intellectual today? What is uh, a cultural perspective that we might want to hear from you about that question? Well, <clears throat> I was first surprised by the uh, intitulé. Um, a title of this meeting as a, I don't, s intellectuals happen always to be public uh, because the publicity is a, is a conviction of being an intellectual. Even if you uh, don't want to be, it's, uh, it's a part of the state of an intellectual. He has to be public to exist and he has to be uh, public to issue statements or to write books. That's uh, the point. But the other thing was the, 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 the quote of, um, of uh, Walter Nelson. Um, about um, a preserver of the ideas of the past, of the great ideas of the past, and the, the dichotomy that was made between this point of view and the other one, which was uh, the idea that the intellectual should be someone who transmits, um, who, 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 who works and who, uh, who fights for new ideas of freedom and liberty. And in my opinion, there's no difference in these two uh, positions, as you can't fight for the ideas of freedom with a tabula rasa. Uh, tabula rasa? Ah. Oh, it's no word. Good. Um, um, with a tabula rasa of, um, 
of anything which comes from the past. And you have to set your ideas on something stronger than you alone and your, your positions. And you have to set your ideas from things, from, uh, from things has, that have been uh, brought in the past. And you said I was, I have five minutes? You said I belong to a group which was Ulipo. The purpose of Ulipo, which is a workshop for literature, potential literature, uh, is we, we, we build literature which is based mainly on constraints. These constraints come from the past, they can come from the very near past, or from the very far past, like we can build, for example, poetry which is pontoons, which is Baudelaire, which is a Malaysian, uh, a Malaysian uh, pro type of poetry, or we can use also type of forms to write that come from very far away. And knowing these forms and uh, working on these forms is not only uh, an aesthetical uh, point of view, it's also saying, from my point of view, the capacity of writers, of poets, of the humanity uh, to uh, take advantage of all the things that have been done for poetry and literature before, and to extend this, to extend this position to a political point of view. This, of course, explains that this is a state of, uh, uh, of uh, um, Point of departure. A point of departure for um, uh, for thinking, which is, of course, very fecund. Uh, Fruitful. Oh, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, and so, so that, that's what I said from the beginning. It's uh, the total absence of tabula rasa and the, the, the necessity of, of using things that come from the future to, uh, to build a new society, uh, a different society, a more equal society. It can't be built without using things uh, totally new. You have to uh, use everything that comes from the past. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that later. Very good. Linda. Um, well, I was like you, I was also surprised about the title of this meeting. Uh, because, uh, and well, more surprised about the fact that I was invited for this meeting. <laughs> Uh, because I'm not an intellectual, uh, I'm a journalist, um, uh, I'm at the, in the best scenario, I'm a communicator. Um, what I try to do is um, observe and analyze problems that fascinate me. Uh, and and I, I believe that uh, if I look at things that fascinate me, that there must be other people who are fascinated by it as well. Um, I observe and I analyze and then I try to write it down for as large an aud audience as possible. Um, and only recently I was uh, reading up uh, on uh, Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Propaganda for, for uh, Hitler, and he was describing um, how he worked uh, in, 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 his, in his practice. Um, he said uh, that uh, he never aimed to uh, communicate with, uh, with intellectuals because intellectuals cannot be convinced of anything. They already are who they are, and they believe what they believe. So he aimed for the masses. He aimed for uh, the, the large audiences, uh, because those people could be reached. And uh, the masses can be reached by using easy arguments, by using um, uh, simple wordings, etc. I believe that what Goebbels already knew um, is still understood by those in power these days. Um, if you look, for example, at um, the communicators of our armies, um, they are no longer called public relations people or a spokesperson. They are called perception managers. Um, they, they, I, I was reading, I was leaving through, not reading, I was leaving through a manual for uh, NATO uh, army spokespeople on uh, how to handle journalists and how to handle the media. Um, and they said uh, they actually describe the media as vehicles for our message. If you look at the budgets of those in power for the perception management, those budgets are so immensely uh, larger than uh, the budgets for journalism. And I believe that is where the danger lies. I believe that the perception manager or managers of this planet are actually taking over from, from journalism, from analysis, from research, and from communicating 
with, uh, with people to actually explain or try to explain what's happening here. We are becoming um, the victims of the perception managers. And this is what I try to do, which has nothing to do with intellectualism. It has to do with a certain devotion in my work um, um, with a mission in life. And that's, uh, uh, that mission is very ambitious. It's uh, to make the world a little bit better. And I try to do that by communicating with all of you and with many other people too. Um, nothing intellectual just to have a, 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 a healthy brain. Yeah. <laughs> and use it. And use it, yeah. And show what you see. Thank you. I'll come, I'll come back with some questions for you all at here. The, the, the army's use of the phrase perception manager um, to, for their PR people reminds me of when they, when they started relatively recently to recruit um, academic anthropologists into the army. It was, it was during the, this latest Iraq war. And they, the army term for these anthropologists who came in, who usually had you know, PhDs and they were pro proper academic anthropologists, was human terrain specialists. Um, and <laughs> in a sense, I think that's, you know, I mean, in, in a sense for all of us, that's, that's what's interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a grotesque use of the phrase, but, but human terrain. Um, I, I'm also a little self-conscious about the, 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 the phrase, well, intellectual to begin with, and, and certainly public intellectual. But I think it's, a, I think it, I think it's as much a cultural um, embarrassment in my case, and I think that certainly in England, and, and to, to, to a slightly lesser extent in America, but in Anglophone society, there's a, there's a kind of, um, th th there's a sort of, embarrassment factor about the term intellectual. There's a, there's a natural suspicion I, I sense, for example, for any polymaths at all. There's a, it's like, what are you? You've got to be specialized in something. And, you know, that old, old um, insult that, that if, you, if you become too academic, you learn more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about nothing. It's, it's true, I mean, that sort of stovepipe um, uh, uh, environment grows up in, in halls of academe where people have their have their um, you know are very very specialised. But there's really you know the, the, then you, you need the kind of people like I don't know Malcolm Gladwell and 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 various people come along and synthesise all of this. But for me, I'm 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 an accidental observer. In so far as I grew up in Africa, uh, um, in really what was the end of white colonial Africa, but growing up to me, although I realized something was wrong very early on because, because the war began around me, um, it was only later, and as, you, as I got older, that I realized you know, the extent to which I'd actually been privileged to have this sort of front row seat on enormous um, you know, cycles of history, which usually in a generation you never really get to see. You get to see a, a little bit of one or the other, but, but I got to see really the, the, the end of colonial Rhodesia, settler rule, civil war, the, 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 beginning, uh, Af the rise of African nationalism, the end of the Cold War, which I reported on. And I must say, I mean, in my entire experience of, um, of a society's appetite for the truly intellectual, for ideas, in other words, enthusiasm, just unbridled enthusiasm for ideas, almost for their own purpose, but, but for more than that too, the, the, the two that stick out in my mind were, I think the single most intellectual place I've ever been to was, was Hungary just before the end of the Cold War, where everybody seemed astonishingly educated and excited by ideas and wanted to talk at, an, at, at really a kind of surprisingly high level about things. Um, and, and once the Cold War ended, it sort of sank into that sloth of, of consumerism again. And, and the second thing was really in, in Africa, where there's this thirst for education, um, you know, not to get ahead and get a good job and go and work for Goldman Sachs, but just really a, a thirst for ideas, which, is, which I have to say I find humbling. I mean, because I, I had a privileged upbringing and, and, and went to good schools. To see that thirst for education, um, I find uh, truly humbling. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Um, buenas tardes, en primer lugar. First of all, good afternoon. Quería dar las gracias a la organización del PEN Internacional. I'd like to thank PEN International por esta invitación y por compartir con mis colegas este panel. For inviting me to share this panel with my colleagues. 
también quiero aprovechar la presencia de Judith Gurevich, la editora de like to Press. take advantage of the presence of Judith Gurevich, the director of Other Press. Una persona generosa, who is a very generous and intelligent person. Que demuestra una gran estima por todos los autores que pertenecen who, a su editorial. Who really loves all the authors that write for her uh, publishing company. Eh, tengo el privilegio de haber sido el último en hablar. I have the privilege of being the last in line to speak today. Entonces, he podido escuchar las opiniones de cada uno de mis colegas. I have been able to listen to the opinions of each one of my colleagues. En primer lugar, estoy de acuerdo con so, Hervé Letelier. First of all, I have to say I agree with Hervé Letelier. En que el escritor y el intelectual in, es por definición una figura pública. In so far as saying that the intellectual and the writer is in fact a public figure. Desde el, momento, by its definition. desde el momento en que sus libros se distribuyen a un público, a una audiencia Be más o menos amplia. Because their books, their publishings are, are distributed in a more or less large audience. También estoy de acuerdo con usted, Linda, en la, en la percepción del periodismo como I, vehículo de comunicación. I also agree with you when you say that uh, journalism is a vehicle for communication. Muchos de nosotros hemos tenido una experiencia periodística, hemos colaborado en... Many of us have uh, written uh, journalistic pieces, we've written for the press. Y esto multiplica el alcance de nuestra voz. Which multiplies the reach of our voice. Y finalmente, estoy Finally, de acuerdo contigo... Finally, I also agree with you. ...en que todos hemos sido testigos We de algunas facetas de la historia. We have witnessed some piece of history. Tú has sido testigo del fin del colonialismo you en el norte de África. The end of colonialism in parts of Africa. Del mismo modo que yo fui testigo del fin de la dictadura franquista y el comienzo de la democracia. I was the witness of the end of the Franco dictatorship and the beginning of democracy in Spain. Pero lo que es interesante, what's es interesting, que, however, in this, es que nos proponen escoger entre la actitud de Emerson is that we are asked to choose between Emerson's depositario de la historia intelectual opinion about uh, the uh, receptacle for intellectual history y la actitud de Edward Said and Edward Said's thought que proyecta la voluntad del intelectual hacia el futuro which uh, projects the will of the intellectual into the future creo que no son actitudes contradictorias sino complementarias I don't think this is a contradiction rather they complement each other todos nosotros somos depositarios de una memoria. We all hold memories. Y todos nosotros proyectamos hacia el futuro lo que queremos que sea mejor. We are repositories of memory and we project into the future something we believe is better. Ahora bien, yo soy escéptico. But I'm skeptical. Sobre las posibilidades del intelectual de intervenir en la historia. About the possibilities that an intellectual has to affect history. Tomaré un ejemplo muy remoto. Let me just give a very far off example. El ejemplo del filósofo Seneca. Seneca, the philosopher. Que fue el maestro y preceptor. The master, the teacher. De Nerón, del emperador Nerón. Nero, Nero, the emperor. Es decir, la intervención intelectual de Seneca. In other words, Seneca's intellect. Produjo un monstruo histórico. Produced a historical monster. Si nos acercamos a nuestros tiempos. Closer to our times, current times, podemos enumerar we could name intelectuales que han tenido un efecto positivo en la historia, intellectuals that have had a positive uh, intellectuales effect han, in history, y intelectuales que han tenido un efecto desastroso en la historia. And those who have had disastrous effects in history. Voy a aprovechar que tengo so, aquí un colega francés. I have a French colleague here, so para señalar la opuesta actitud I'll take the opportunity to de, point out de Albert Camus o de Céline for instance the opposite views between Albert Camus and Céline after uh, World War II y en este sentido el optimismo de Edward Said Edward Said's optimism in this sense de que el intelectual colabora saying that a aumentar la libertad de la sociedad humana intellectuals co uh, help increase freedom uh, in human yo no creo, en este in society, yo no creo no creo en este desarrollo lineal de la bondad. I don't really believe in linear development of goodness. Creo que en la historia hay profundos cortes. I think history has profound y hay épocas sort of, negras. Uh, cuts and there are dark dark periods. Desafortunadamente. Unfortunately. 
Entonces, el deber de cada uno de nosotros our duty, then, each one of our duties, es forjarse con la memoria que propone Emerson is to use the memory such as Emerson proposes una ética to create some ethics que nos permita vivir nuestra propia historia intelectual allowing us to live our own intellectual history honestamente. Honestly. El ejemplo ideal para nosotros for us the creo, ideal example in my opinion yo creo que es el de Montaigne, el de Michel de Montaigne. Would be Michel Montaigne. Montaigne que fue el, el, el hombre honrado por excelencia, el honesto por The excelencia, on, honest man, y al mismo tiempo se, ocupó con competencia and also at the same time, la alcaldía de Burdeos. He was the mayor of uh, Burdeos. I... Bordeaux. Bordeaux. Sorry. Es una aspiración muy pequeña. Perhaps this is not much of an aspiration. Pero hay una grandeza But there is greatness in honestamente in being honest when you take that uh, position. Y nada más, si algunas preguntas tienen, pues aquí I don't know if you have any more questions, but I'll gladly answer. Thank you. I'm going to ask, the, we have two novelists up here on the panel, and we have two journalists. So I'm going to ask the novelists, beginning with um, Manuel and then de Hervé, to talk a little bit about the um, Uh, inspiration of your most recent book in your case, Manuel, The Wrong Blood, and how that might have come from your witnessing of these historic events that you mentioned, the fall of Franco. And then I'll come to Hervé. You first, and then Hervé, and then I'll ask, yes, yeah. Bueno, yo, yo tuve una experiencia política temprana. I had a, I had a very early political experience. Cuando años I was 20, en, bajo la dictadura de Franco. Under Franco's dictatorship. Pero yo no estaba destinado a ser escritor. However, my destiny was not to become a writer at the time. Eh, cuando pasé al exilio en Francia, When I went into exile in France, eh, mi intención no era escribir novelas. Uh, my idea was not to write novels. Yo tenía una formación de economista y de ingeniero. I, was, uh, I had studied economy and engineering. Y creo que el trauma o la alteración que se produjo en mi vida con I think that the traumatic experience encontró a letra, una vía de salida en literatura. Found a channel to express itself through literature. Pero no creo que nadie pueda encontrar en, en mi obra But I don't think in my work anybody could find ninguna referencia a aquella experiencia política. Any uh, reference to my political experience. Creo que la, la experiencia, la intervención política en este sentido es, es directa, humana, como ciudadano. I think my political experience in that sense is rather direct as a human being, as a citizen. Que sé y soy consciente de que debo tomar posesión. Who is aware that I have to take a position. Y también sé que ciertas cosas que yo pueda decir I also know some things that I can say tienen una resonancia que no tienen en el ciudadano normal. Have more resonance than if a, norm, a regular citizen says it. Y debo medir mis palabras. So I must, uh, I must think of my words, measure my words. So you have what they call a bully pulpit in some cases. Do the bully pulpit? Uh, uh, you have the uh, voice, uh, the public voice, it means more than... Yeah. Eh, efectivamente, mm -hmm. yes. efectivamente. Yes, yes. Did you find that from exile? No, 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 no. Yeah. Esto ha sido, esto, esto se encuentra con el tiempo. You found that over time. Con el conocimiento del público, de la audiencia. Learning and knowing your, no, your audience, uh -huh. the public. Hervé, uh -huh. as a novelist, yeah. I know you talk about, uh, about you know, you have so many books, I don't know which one to start, but... Uh, Uh, a way of not treating history, but at the same time, uh, in my first life, I was also uh, something very different from a writer. Uh, I was a mathematician for about uh, for some years, and uh, after that I was a, a journalist. And I remember, as you told about uh, for prescription managers, the phrase that I heard, which was that journalists were like mushrooms. You know that? Yeah, you know keep them in the dark and feed them with shit. 
which is something that the, the, the army said about the uh, embarked journalist, which was a very good uh, metaphor of the situation of a journalist. Coming back to uh, my situation, I was born, of course, uh, after the three events I was. I was, I was, not after, but I was, I was an adult. After the two events, which were very important for France, which was the Guerre d'Algérie, the War of Algeria, which never was called the War of Algeria, but always the Algerian events. So that uh, it was never a war, but uh, thousands of soldiers died there. And after the other important event, which was May 68, May 68, which is an event which might look a bit like Hungary, which is a situation where people talk more than they have ever talked and where the idea of uh, exchanging ideas is so strong that it gives you an idea of how the people can change in very little time, giving the idea that a revolution can change things. I remember something that I, s I heard about the situation on the place that is, which was two months ago, which was a woman with no hair, with no, uh, with no view on their hair, could cross the place without being insulted because it was a revolution and people changed. So it's very important to have this in mind because it shows something about how people can change during situations which are historical. And I think in my books, even if I talk about love, I, uh, and I try to, ex for example, in the last book, not the last book, but the last book published, uh, it's uh, the thing which interests me is to um, think about how men and women um, should and could behave in situations which are induced by love, but which also involve a lot of social behaviors, which are educated and uh, in, 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 um, imprimé, impr imprimé, imprinted, imprinted their behaviors, and how they can get rid of it. And uh, this is a very important situation because, of course, uh, if you can get rid of something which is imprinted in you, it means something, on, uh, a work on you which is very important, and which has to do with history, and which has to do with culture, and which has to do with memory. And that means that uh, reading books and, and writing books uh, leads us to a certain analysis, not of psychology, but on uh, what man is. And this is the most important thing I could say about uh, how um, how I, I, I work in books. The last book I wrote is about, uh, is about the a situation which occurs after the revolution of Désolé uh, in, in Salazar, after the Salazar dictatorships. And also what it takes in, in account is the evolution of, uh, of the mentalities after uh, the liberation from Salazarism. And um, I'm very much interested in people's psychology in these moments of, uh, of this, this can be very short moments, like I said, for the place tabus, and where people change because the situation changes and they change very quickly inside. Of course, it's ephemeral, it can change, but for a few moments, if history moves, people move too. Mm -hmm. That's how I see the things. Do you think we might be at a time like that now? I think about a country devastated by an earthquake, a tsunami, and a nuclear meltdown. I think about Tahrir Square and Misrata and all the things that are going on around the world this moment that we maybe something we don't know yet happened today. Do you think we're at a moment like that now? Well, you mentioned two months ago. There's a danger, which is to say we are at a turn because we are always at a turn. Uh, history is made of turns. Uh, I think the. When, you say, when, when uh, Manuel talked about intellectuals, I think my figure of the, of the intellectual is not Seneca, it's, uh, it's Erasmus. Because Erasmus is at a turn, a real turn. He's at the moment where the reform and Luther is going to change everything in the world. Um, of course, it's also happening at the moment of the discovery of a new continent, and the, places of, of the place of Europe is going to change, and many things are going to change. Uh, the place of the Pope, the, fake, the fact that they, they discover a new continent which is not in the Bible. This opens, and then the, of course, the event, the, the fundamental event of the book, the coming of printing, which is a very important moment, explains 
while at this moment, strangely, an intellectual like Erasmus has no effect on history at all. But Luther has, and he's not an intellectual. He's a man of action, he's a man of faith, and he's also a man of violence, and he had an effect on history. And this is a, a very interesting point for me, which, which leads me to a sometimes pessimistic uh, point of view, which is that people of violence are more strong than people of intellect. At certain times, of, at, at the same time, I, I can defend the exact opposite point of view. <laughs> which, which proves that I am an intellectual. <laughs> well, there is a fair amount of, of agreement amongst you, and the reference to Hungary reminded me of a, a Milan Kundero a novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, in which after uh, one of the characters goes to Cambodia and he's watching a protest and he thinks, you know, maybe part of the protest wasn't actually that anybody believed they could free uh, anyone, but rather that to show that people existed who were not afraid. Mm -hmm. And that, that fear, to go up against fear, might be a value. Um, which I think sometimes is, is, is currently one of the ways in which individuals are able, like in, in um, various of the countries in, in, in recently in the Arab world, where one person will stand up and it's like a flash fire begins. I would like to speak to the two journalists now, Linda and Peter, to talk a little bit about what you have witnessed and how it has shaped your work. Linda, you have had a shift in how you perceive things having witnessed the, the African genocide, and, and I see that as one of your... Uh, well, it's, it's very true that I've seen quite a few of very nasty things, because um, uh, at a certain stage of my journalistic career, I decided that it was necessary to find out exactly how UN peacekeeping missions work. So that meant that I had to go to all these places where UN peacekeepers are. And they are called peacekeepers, but they are usually sent to places where the war is still going on. There's only a peace on paper, if that at all. Um, so I did go to places like Somalia and like Rwanda and like, uh, like Sierra Leone, for example. <coughs> and all those places have had really, really ugly wars. Um, that did... Um, Obviously, um, and I'm, 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 that's only healthy, I think, it did change me, yes. It did influence me. Um, but I, I, I have been this sort of war correspondent for 15 or 17 years or something. Um, and uh, only recently I discovered that I had been doing it too long. Mm -hmm. Because um, um, I found that um, I was... Um, 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 I, I started to find war and ugliness normal. Um, and that's when I lost uh, my uh, ambition to communicate about how bad war was. I, did, I, I found it normal and um, I forgot to communicate what war was really about. <coughs> so that is what, when I decided to take a break. Mm -hmm. I left Africa, went back to Holland and decided to write a book about what, what I'd seen. Um, so it did, it did actually change me, yes, um, but not necessarily in a, in a good way. Um, did it also, but did it not, your books actually take on a position that is quite interesting. Not too many people really analyzed the work <coughs> of UN peacekeeping missions and concluded they're not working it, and given a, a real argument why they're not. Um, well, I... I I thought that uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the United Nations. One, one of the very few people on this planet, I, I think, that think that the United Nations are a good idea. Um, because the United Nations are, uh, in the end, all we have. Uh, the rest is self-interest. The United Nations is there to serve the peoples that have n nobody to serve them. Obviously, in reality, that doesn't work. You know, the UN is corrupt. It's being abused, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, it's the only thing we have. So I think we should we should take care of the United Nations, and it deserves a fair judgment because all of us, uh, if we keep on uh, persisting uh, in our conviction that the United Nations are no good and they only throw our money away and they're corrupt, etc., then uh, and we should stop with this United Nations. Then, um, then we lose something that is really valuable. So when I, I, I went to Somalia um, by accident, 
um, not, not to go to the UN peacekeeping at all. I didn't know anything at all about Somalia. Uh, but I was at home in Amsterdam one day. I'll tell you how, how, I, how I got there. I was at home in Amsterdam one day, zapping in front, of the, on, in front of the television. And then an old friend called. He was a freelance photographer whom I met on one of my, on one of my, my journeys. And he called me and said, Linda, I'm, I'm, I'm calling you to say goodbye. Um, I cannot live as a freelance photographer anymore. There's no money in it. I found a job working um, for a catering company in Somalia. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Good luck. Call me when, when, when you come back to England. And he, he promised he would. And I hung up the phone. And then only hours later, it struck me what he had actually said. He had said that he was going to work for a catering company in Somalia. I hardly knew where Somalia was, but I did know that there was a famine there. So this, this combination of catering in a country where people were dying of hunger fascinated me. And I decided to go because, uh, I mean, I smelled a story, obviously. So I went and I uh, flew to Somalia, which was possible to my great surprise, um, not uh, by Transavia or KLM to Mogadishu, but I could fly to Nairobi. There I found out that the only way to get to uh, Mogadishu in Somalia was by United Nations airplane. I asked them for, for a ride and they gave me a ride in one of their airplanes. And they dropped me in Mogadishu right in the middle of this war, which was called Continue Hope. Uh, and it was a UN peacekeeping mission. And by the time I was there, America had already spoiled everything there. Um, because when I was there, America was, was packing up its army uh, and shipping it out of Somalia because Black Hawk Down, you know, they had, uh, they had killed uh, uh, American um, uh, Marines. They were dragged through the streets of, of, uh, of uh, Mogadishu. Everybody saw this on CNN, and that for Bill Clinton at the time, the president, was the reason to abandon the United Nation, Nations mission immediately. <coughs> and the UN peacekeepers, who were all soldiers from very poor countries, 90% of the soldiers who work for the United Nations as military are, are soldiers from poor countries. The uh, UN peacekeeping missions are, are black African missions, or they're mapped by Indians or people from Bangladesh. Rich soldiers do not work for the United Nations. Uh, so um, um, th these poor soldiers from places like Egypt and India and Bangladesh, they were left behind there by the American army. The American army had promised to stay to protect them, but the American army left. So these peacekeeping soldiers were left behind, and I decided to stay with them to see what was going to happen with them. Um, and um, uh, they, were expecting me to, they were expecting to be eaten alive by the, uh, by the warlords. Uh, of Somalia. So I stayed with them for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, living inside the UN as a sort of um, a spy. <laughs> I lived in a container, yes, uh, together with people who worked for Halliburton, Brown and Root. They were already existing then and they were packing up the American army. So I decided to live with them for, for weeks. And then um, I, um, I, I thought that um, the UN was being given a really false uh, judgment. Uh, these, these soldiers were left behind without guns, without a mandate, etc. And still, um, when I was inside this camp, I could watch CNN and I could see CNN reports blaming the United Nations for a failed mission. But in reality, it was the American army who had, a, who had a ban abandoned the mission. So I wanted to write about that and I wanted to, to, uh, to correct the perception of the world um, uh, about UN peacekeepers. So this is what I did. I uh, followed the UN peacekeepers around many, many uh, countries at war. Uh, and then I produced this book called We Did Nothing. Um, um, I think that you have argue that you have fulfilled the role as a public intellectual in witnessing something and, and in analyzing it and in presenting information to people who might not have had a chance because all they would see was the CNN. Or all they would hear would be one government's point of view. Um, yes, yes, but it doesn't yeah. feel like you're doing intellectual work because you're there um, uh, eating shit. <laughs> oh, okay. Peter, how about you? I mean, uh, I mean it, 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 well, you don't have to use the word intellectual. It's okay if you don't want really, it. You've been witness to many things, yeah. including most recently in Mugabe. I was just saying to you, Peter, in his book, is, is, is back inside Mugabe, Zimbabwe, and, and he's at a dinner party with a, with a priest, and he's telling about the victims of torture he's been talking to. And I mean, it, you're, you're in, in the lion's claw almost. So yeah, it's, I mean, what, what yeah. I did, what I had seen in being back there on several fronts about going in and out, and in fact, it it it, it, um, it references something that something that you were saying that about whether 
whether exile gives you a filter or a kind of distance that's sometimes required to adjust your focal length to get a certain clarity. And I, to some extent, I thought it was exile, but now that I think about it, being a public intellectual, that's what we do, um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, that it's, it's distance, either chronological or geographical, that sometimes is required to kind of, for you to really understand what you've been seeing, because you're sort of almost too close to it. I mean, for, to give you some examples, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've witnessed from the inside a number of authoritarian regimes, living un under authoritarian regimes. And what's really fascinating about, for example, the differences or indeed the similarities between living under Ian Smith and white rule and that authoritarian regime in Rhodesia is how incredibly similar it became to living under Mugabe's authoritarian rule, that how they use very much the same building blocks and how that in the end when you think about it that it wasn't so much, I, mean, I started out thinking that dictators were interesting and if you wanted to understand dictatorships you study dictators. But the more I witnessed it, the more I realized that essentially in any school, um, in any school playground, a bully will emerge if he or she is allowed to emerge. That actually, it's weirdly s systemic. I mean, systems, having systems and checks and balances boring as that may sound, is actually the, the thing that stops him. That, I mean, you know, you take the figure of Robert Mugabe. I mean, he's, he's, he should be up here. He's a public intellectual. He's a man with six or seven degrees, I think, um, very widely read. Um, and yet, when you see, you know, how he's emerged, it's quite interesting because, in a sense, uh, and you see this in, in, in a number of regimes where, where one authoritarian regime is followed by a revolution and replaced by another authoritarian regime, and Russia and all sorts of, I mean, so many places it's, it's, it's not even worth mentioning them, is that there, there is um, what we were talking about, um, social conditioning, that there is this sort of conditioning, and that the people are conditioned too to accept authoritarian rule in a way that they, they've been cowed once before and they kind of go back into that same mindset and they think it's a different boss, it may be a different color, it may be fascist or communist or whatever, but they, they go. And so what surprised me, I mean, that this latest book, which is actually called The Fear, um, as you said, is, uh, it was an accidental book. I mean, I was slightly embarrassed because I feel like I'm, I keep going back to write about this one little country, and it's a tiny little Central African country that nobody really cares about. But it, in a way, it's bigger than the, it, it, it's a sort of petri dish for me. It's like a little, it's, it's bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, because it's had this astonishing trajectory in a very short period of time, it, it's kind of fascinating. I mean, it's a little bit like literary keyhole surgery, but, it's, but it, is, it is fascinating fascinating to see. And in this, um, in, in this last election, um, um, it was sort of slightly blood, uh, I mean, sinister in so far as what, what, what started to happen when Mugabe was forced into having an election at all. And he's a rather fastidious dictator in that respect. He's not some sort of Idia Min or some Nigerian general with medals clanking on across his chest. He's rather fastidious and wants to preserve the facade of, of a democracy. Because he was Jesuit trained. Because he was Jesuit trained also, because he was a liberation yeah. hero, yeah. because he was someone who liberated his country and went to prison and went into exile and you know ser ser served his paid his dues. Um, and, the, and and what happens though is that if if you are a liberation hero, I mean, and you see it. You'll see it in Cuba, for example. You you can draw on the revolution, you know, endlessly as this sort of font of legitimacy that you are the revolutionary, and 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 so and and you can use it as a way to stop any uh, any other legitimate opposition to your rule. So, for example, when you when you watch an election an, an election in Zimbabwe, you can see Mugabe looking at the electorate and saying, "How can you possibly vote against me?" If it weren't for me, you wouldn't have a vote. Um, and there's a sort of, you know, th there's, a, there's a kind of messianic, um, th there's a sort of messiah complex that can come in. My point being that what they did was, he needed to, uh, I mean, this I found fascinating, he needed to intimidate everybody. Um, and, but instead of killing them, sort of ethnic cleansing style or political cleansing style and whatever, it, it's, it's been, uh, you, you realize what's actually happening is that this, that, that, that it's been refined now. So instead of killing hundreds of thousands of people, you now only need to kill 
three or four hundred people, maybe a thousand, the right people. And the rest of them he put through torture camps um, but, but, and tortured them terribly. I mean, tens of thousands of people, but then released them back into their own communities with these awful, you know, broken limbs and everything else, like political stigmata, released back into their own communities at, where they were basically human billboards. They were advertisements for what happens if you raise your head above the political <laughs> parapet and oppose, op oppose the president. Um, and it was, and it, was, it, was, it was very effective. But what was also interesting is to watch the people themselves who were of different socioeconomic groups, um, not just sort of educated people, but, you know, they, and they were opposition members, but, it, you know, often at just village level, start to, start to almost be surprised at their own behavior as they realized... They, they were, it was almost as though they were, they were surprised by their own courage. And I recognize that, I see it in Egypt and these other, and, you know, where you sort of see people trying something on and you have that brief little window that you were talking about where people try something and then say, well, we could, you know, and suddenly there's this flowering. But, but what happens next, and, 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 and I don't think this got sufficiently reported um, in the Egyptian case, for example, was you know what's the crucial next step is how the security forces behave. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, do, are you able to put the stems of your f flowers down their barrels? And it's a crack down. Right, and in yeah. Zimbabwe, you could do that, but the live ammunition would be coming the other way. So you know that's that's the difference. But it's it's very interesting, you know, when you start to, when you've covered enough of these things to start. For me, what it is looking for patterns and starting to see these patterns. I mean, it, for example, in in Africa. And there was a great flowering of democracy in Africa immediately um, on, at, at the end of the Cold War. And I did a number of long documentaries for the BBC in the very early 90s, where suddenly, you know, one after the other, African states were becoming democratic. And for very good reason, because if you think about it, Africa starts becoming independent. I'm talking about um, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa in this point. Starts becoming independent, I mean, really with, with Ghana in 1957. And we're already well into the Cold War. And the Cold War has already begun at the end of the Second World War. Um, and so from the very beginning, those first generations of independent um, black African countries are, are taught that the only thing that's important, the way they'll be judged on the international stage, is whether they're pro-communist or pro-capitalist, whether they're pro-Washington or pro-Moscow. Pro and that's all that really matters. And so for decades and decades, we in the West are quite happy to support, you know, Mobutu or, or Siad Barre or, or, you know, Hufre uh, Banya um, or whoever. It's fine. As long as they are dictators, that's okay. So we have, we have the, the international system in the West in particular has this enormous contributory blame for, you know, for this, what's become a sort of cliche of bad African leaders, many of whom... Well, who uh, in, the, in the Cold War? Right, many of whom become non-democratic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, and I think that that is part of, and suddenly, in 1990, we tear up the rule book and we say, guess what, it's, it's you know, we don't care about that now. We, you're on paper, at least, you've got to be accountable and you've got to be democratic and you've got to be open and transparent and all these different things. So, and, and, and you have this kind of bubbling under, and I did this program um, in '93, in I think. And what's so interesting is that almost all of the young revolutionaries coming up that I concentrated on have themselves turned into dictators or become corrupt. I mean, I mean, w one of them was Laurent Gbagbo in Cote d'Ivoire, so you know, who's just recently had to be prized from power by the by the by the ex-colonial forces. Um, Frederick Chaluba in Zambia, who stole huge amounts of money and had to be kicked out. So it's it is that there is often a very very brief window in which. But you mentioned there seems to be a shift now to what in your book you call smart genocide. Well, the lobby is really kind of being targeting. Right. Well, that happening in other countries? Yes, I think that one of the things that, that has happened, I mean, and it's, 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 is that you can actually keep the media out. I mean, Mugabe has done that very successfully. He keeps the media out at, at crucial points. He keeps the media out. Um, and, and what interests me is that you know, this book, when it, I went on a book tour in South Africa, and I thought, well, if anybody knows about what's going on in Zimbabwe, it's the you know it's the, the regional power next door, and yet and yet South Africans were acting as though they hadn't really known about it, and I think that's what you can do when you expand something 
out of journalism into a, you know into a, into a book that you can actually tell a fully formed narrative in a way that's much more effective than the little drip 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 of of cable news, which can become almost numbing, I think, to to general order. Well, bringing me to the question I want to address to the, the panel about witnessing. I mean, in a, in a way, if there is no one there to see what is happening, then there is no story told. What is the role in witnessing for today's intellectual or publicly intellectual or for today's writer? What, what is the point to be made and what new forms might you be able to be using? Hervé, you're, you're on Twitter for Le Monde. Uh, I'm not on Twitter. Oh, uh, I you said you said Twitter. Well, I, the thing I do for Le Monde is very close to a tweet because it's uh, a tweet. 200 yeah. times long, which is very close to it as tweet is, uh, is about uh, 140, 140. Okay. So every day I write for Le Monde, for newspaper, uh, for the electronic uh, newspaper Le Monde. I write for, for about 10 years a very short sentence of 200 signs which resumes the world. I do it from my home, I never go to Le Monde, which makes me uh, the most lazy journalist maybe in the world, <laughs> and the shortest. And uh, the. Uh, what influence do you feel you have? I have a small window in the world too, yeah. which is uh, a man point of view every day. The thing which interests me is that it's very short, so I have to know exactly what I think. And the thing I discover every time I do this job is that I don't know what I think. It's, uh, I have to, uh, because I write on everything. I write on what's happening in Tunisia, I write on what's uh, on the, the emergence in France of uh, Le Front National, the National Front, Extreme Right, which is not so important, but which is important. And I also can write about uh, the election of Obama and anything like this. Every time I have to think what I really think, and sometimes my thought is not precise enough to be resu it's not precise enough to be resumed in 200 signs. It's strange, but it has to be extremely precise. I have really to know what I think. And it takes me hours. And, uh, and this is very interesting for me, mm -hmm. which, which leads us to the thing that you said about uh, Goebbels. When, he, when Goebbels said, well, I address to the masses because the, 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 the masses, uh, uh, I can influence them because the intellectuals know what they know. I think an intellectual doubts. He doesn't know. And this is the strength of uh, religious, religious people. They don't doubt. Mm -hmm. It's the strength of, uh, of dictators. They don't doubt. They have a, a very strong ego. And uh, we, as I think, I, I, don't, I don't doubt I, I am intellectual. I'm sure I'm not a manual. Everybody says so. <laughs> anyway. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the definition could be someone who always doubts. But tries to know what is at the end of his doubt to be, to be his thought. And, to be, and even if it's not exactly what we think, it's close to what we finally think. I have very, a lot of difficulty when I finish something of 200 words, which is very short, to be satisfied. I always think I could have made better. And uh, this is my main problem with uh, this, this type of work, is to analyze news and to make out of news a formula a very strong formula. I would love to think against a political guy, this time I have killed him. But it never happens. Uh, I make people laugh, but I never kill people. I have a very, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not powerful enough to kill people. Sometimes I'm very happy when I can reduce it to a tweet, send the tweet, and see the, see the tweet come back from someone else, and not signed, and I know it's mine. I know it's a, it's a joke about someone. And uh, I, I'm very, I'm, I, I'm very, oops, I'm very confident in the power of love, and in the power of uh, of uh, destroying authority. I think one of the rules of intellectuals is destroy authority. No one has can have authority on anyone, and I think this is one of the things I can do at my at my scale, is destroy authority. <laughs> and think. And think. And so sure, you think. Doubt and lead people to independence by thinking, no, uh, this, I, I can think this, I'm, a, I'm allowed to. <laughs> Others who might want to talk about that. It's, I mean, yeah, and it's not only about uh, the importance of observing, because mm -hmm. even in the remotest places and in the most horrible dictatorships, there are observers. Uh, mm -hmm. there, are, there are local people who are observing, there are human rights groups who are observing. There are the United Nations that are observing, and they all produce these reports, which we don't bother to read. 
Um, the same thing goes for, for images from, from places like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not interested in just images. No, they need to be photographs that are worthy of a world press photo, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so um, to translate those reports and to translate the images that people pr produce from, from those places, there you, you probably need well, the communication or even the art mm -hmm. of communicating. The storytelling, you know, if yes. you will, narrative. Yes. Because before that, people yeah. will not register yeah. it. Mm -hmm. all, and all the material is there, all the information is there, but we don't take it, uh, we, we don't take it uh, inside us because it's produced in the wrong, le in the wrong lettering, in the wrong mm -hmm. format. Yeah. So this is where journalism and, 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 and novelists uh, come in. To translate. And setting a scene that people can see. I mean, that's really what, what 25 years ago the idea was the imagination is, is, is what we share. We share information with each other through our imaginations, and countries from one to another can share information as well. I, I wanted to, to share with you the last Twitter feed that came from Tim Hetherington, the photojournalist who died in Libya uh, recently. His last tweet was, in besieged Libyan city of Misrata, indiscriminate shelling by Qaddafi forces, no sign of NATO. Um, through very brief communication, he's telling a story uh, that we now know the end of. And um, he's one of many of the journalists who are out there today, including Linda and Peter. see and to analyze what's happening, we might be um, unable to have the story told and the truth told. It's and I think the, yeah. the, the voice of authority, someone who yeah. has written a story we can trust, yeah. is important given um, the, the misinformation and the disinformation and all the ways that spin is happening. Yeah. It's yeah. a pity that journalism, that the media move in blocks. They, they move en masse. They go, they, most of them go to the same place yes, they go to look at the out. same events. Yes. It would be nice if we could divide ourselves amongst uh, over places that are of importance too. Yes. Yeah, but that's the law. I'm going to ask if any of you have some thoughts on how um, this week might work for the artists and writers who have come together here. Uh, if there are any action, uh, you think about what Penn has done for, uh, in China for Liu Jiabo and the uh, campaign to give him the Nobel Prize and to release him. Are there any other situations you think might be well addressed? And then we're going to take a couple of questions. Anybody? Yeah. I, uh, I only wanted to say that obviously el hombre de la escritura es testigo debe dar testimonio. When uh, the man of words is a writer, he must give uh, witness. En este aspecto, el, el periodista es infinitamente más poderoso. And journalists are infinitely more powerful in this aspect que el novelista, than novelists, for example. Y la, la comunicación entre el testigo. So communication between the witness. Y la sociedad es a través de la prensa. Society is through the media. Yo tuve una experiencia de 10 años de periodismo. For 10 years I was a journalist. En un artículo mensual. I wrote an article per month. En un periódico español. In a país. Spanish newspaper in El País. Y su influencia era muy limitada. It had very little influence. Respecto a los, effect as a compared en el terreno. to the witnesses in the field. También creo que existe una saturación del horror. I also believe we can get saturated with horror. Que, que, que amortigua el efecto del testimonio. Somehow, uh, uh, of, of Hoy día vemos testimony. imágenes espantosas. We see so many horrible images today. En directo. Live. Que en el siglo XIX hubieran puesto los pelos de punta a toda una sociedad. Which in the 19th century would have scandalized all society, horrified people. No. But, but as a novelist, as a novelist, do you not have the opportunity to give us a different way of telling truth that has a narrative, that has human characters with flaws and, and subtleties? A novelist may contribute to informing a collective uh, ethics. 
puede ser una fuerza poderosa cuando interviene en la realidad. And it could be a powerful force if it intervenes in reality. Creo que es un fenómeno relativamente moderno. I think it's a relatively modern phenomenon. Que comienza con la actuación de Emilio Zola en novelista que interviene en un asunto político es relativamente moderno so it's relatively modern amazing sometimes how much more effective the books can be. I mean, you wouldn't, that they're late and they're longer, but somehow you can create a much more textured and um, I've certainly had, I mean, I've had much more, I've had much more feedback, I think. And, I, and, I, and, and one of the things that, that's enormously, that's changed book writing, at least even in, the, in the, the, the period of time I've been doing it, 15 years or so, is that You initially you used to hear back from a few readers you'd get the occasional letter but really not but now in, in, in this electronic age now and everybody has to be on Facebook and one thing you hear back you hear back an awful lot and you get this you know you, you do you do get a feedback which which is um, which is which which is quite gratifying but also you know some of it very combative but it's all useful mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there's that you can do a lot in, in, in books that that journalism can't do. I think it's still worth, it's worthy pursuing. Mm -hmm. Good. Any final comments before I take a couple of questions from the audience? And I don't have many time for much. No, maybe, maybe just an image, which is an image I always liked, which is a publicity for Amnesty International. It's a, a peloton. I don't know if you remember it, a peloton de soldats. Uh, you know, people who fight fire fire squad. A squad of soldiers who are going to fire on someone, and uh, there's bullets going. There's a, a few bullets going out at the, at the you know, and uh, it's it's made of ralenti, very very slowly motion, and then you have hundreds and hundreds of of, of uh, pieces of paper, of sheets of paper, that fall beef in front of the bullets, and every time of course the bullets go through, and at the end. There's so many pieces of paper that the bullets fall down. I think it's a wonderful image of what paper can do. It's a very optimistic image. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's a question over here. Uh, we need a mic. There is a mic so that you can we can hear your question. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gloria Brown Marshall, and I write nonfiction um, and American history from a racial justice point of view. And what I was, you know, in hearing about trust and the witness, I'm wondering as a public intellectual, what's the expectation as far as your ongoing relationship with the actual witness? The person who sees it firsthand. It's almost as though you're seeing it second or third hand. And the main people, those within the masses, maybe without the um, type of, you know, background, education, they're not in a position to speak mm -hmm. as a public intellectual for their own experience. Mm -hmm. So then how do you maintain authenticity? How do you maintain the honesty of being a public intellectual? The one side is, of course, spreading the information that you received after you've analyzed it. But the other part, to be a true witness, what must your relationship be with the person who's on the ground? So you're assuming the witness is not the journalist who's in the war zone? It could be that but journalist in the war zone, but after the war is over and they're still writing about that particular experience, just like with Somalia and the people are still there, and it's something, it's, it's now being written about from a distance in a way. So, oh. so do you have a specific person or anyone who have a, a thought on what's no, that for being a witness? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll give it. I mean, I, in, in, I mean, it's 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 a very good question and it's a very difficult relationship and and it's one that certainly um, worries me a lot. And in in, in the, this last book of mine, I'm specifically talking to victims of torture um, immediately after the event. I mean, I, I witnessed some of it myself, but mostly I'm doing exactly what you're describing. Is that basically I'm. I'm coming away with notebooks full of first-hand testimony. 
and my thought at the time, what I was, what I was trying to do, and, and I'll come to the footnotes to this in a second, is to amplify the voices of those people who weren't being allowed to speak in their own communities, they were being muffled by being tortured, whatever, is to try and give them a voice. Now, you know, that comes with a certain baggage itself, because I'm, whether I like it or not, I'm interposing between them, you know, I'm, I'm interpreting their words, it just in, in, in which words I choose, and you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's enormously complicated, but what, what I was trying to do in that case is to get enough of their views out and their testimony out and put it in a narrative that would, that would give, um, you know, which at the stage I wasn't, I'm not really trying to judge it particularly, I'm just trying to get it out there and to tell that story. Now in a perfect world what happens is that more and more they tell their own story and, 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 and I hope that they will and, and in fact in Zimbabwe they are more and more, in Zimbabwe there's, there's a great flowering of of, of books by black Zimbabweans, or at the moment many of those are in the diaspora, that's what tends to happen, it's that people write these books in exile themselves. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, that it, is sub, it is subjective, whatever we might say, just in, you know, journalism, is, journalism and, and bearing witness in that sense is subjective in so far as you're not just, you know, I, I had a line in my, my book that I felt like I was playing stenographer to their suffering. But I mean, in, you know, in, retro, in, in, in retrospect, that's you know, I, I'm, it's been filtered through me whether I, you know, and that's what I'm. But I think that the way I try to get round it is by writing the book in the first person and by showing enough of myself and who I am that you, I'm not sort of pretend. I, I don't have a pretense of objectivity. And actually, in this last book, I think I probably crossed the line into some kind of call it activism if you like I mean there's, a, there's an element of it because it's, it's, in, it's in the short term but, but in an ideal situation you know, these people tell their own stories absolutely okay one more question I'm sorry but we are actually getting very close to the end of, the t of time um, or how about a quick question oh, uh, oh we have two okay all right um, uh, thank you very much um, I, I was just wondering um, uh, in, in the United States um, and a lot of other countries as well, I imagine we have uh, a very large and elaborate culture of intellectuals uh, in quotation marks who are elaborately funded by think tanks like the American Enterprise Institute, the American uh, Heritage Foundation. Question? I'm sorry, but we're running a little late on time. I just want to okay, so, your question, please. Uh, okay, Thank yeah. You. So what do you think yeah. it does to the status of the public intellectual in general? Um, do you think that someone like... Uh, Lori Milroy, Paul Wolfowitz, whatever, is a public intellectual. Dick Cheney was funded as a fellow by the AEI. Is he an intellectual? So I wonder what, what role does funding play in an intellectual status? Any answers to that? Well, there's less and less, uh, uh, again, I have to speak from a journalism point of view, there's less and less uh, independent journalism going on. Uh, there's a big um, pollution of, uh, of um, uh, independent journalism with sponsored journalism. Um, and that is a danger, yeah. Um, I don't quite know how to stop this. I know that there's many uh, journalists who are trying to reorganize journalism, who are trying to reinvent themselves by reestablishing the journalistic code of independence. But it's really, really difficult because there's less and less money for, for objective independent journalism. So there is, a, there is definitely a danger there that independent journalism is becoming a sort of um, almost um, uh, extinct uh, 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 for, for form of journalism. I'm very worried about that, yeah. Okay, and uh, one last question. Okay. I, I'm sorry, you two. You've got two, two people. If you can be quick, that would be great. Thank you. You said that um, the feedback you got was very gratifying, and I'm wondering, um, as a public uh, thinker and intellectual act, uh, writer, um, what is your relationship with the listener? And when you don't get the listening back, what sustains you? Or you, if, you, if you fear that you're not getting the listening and the feedback, what sustains you and keeps you going? I mean, I, I think, I mean, this particular book, it was a book I, I never set out to write. And once I, once I, and all the journalists have been, foreign journalists have been thrown out. And once I was in there and stayed there, I felt like I had a duty, a sort of duty to do it. I think that, 
I mean, the feedback can be positive or negative, and it's and I try to reply because I think there's a, you know there's a, there is a conversation that goes on. But truthfully, even if you don't hear back, there are certain things that I think you want to lay a record. You you almost want to just have it down there as a record. I mean, I reported very early on on a. Uh, what, what what ended up being called Gokuro Hondi, which is a massacre in Zimbabwe in 1983, and nobody paid any attention to that. I mean, you know, there was n nothing happened to Mugabe. He got honours after that, and, and and he was knighted by the Queen and one thing. Um, but but and now it's quite interesting. Now it's become a big subject. 20 25 years afterwards, but it's all down there as a record. So sometimes you don't get that feedback in real time. But I think it's really important for historical reasons and whatever that you lay this you lay it down and you say here you know and at some point you hope that that people will come back and have a look at it and, and, and it can't be hidden thank you thank you Peter um, thank you all for coming today come to the next event come all week uh, look at www.pen.org to find out what's going on um, thank you to all of our panelists you've been remarkable it's been a pleasure to be here